And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The influence of Jeroen Bosch is clearly visible in this work by Bruegel, especially in the faces of the almost caricatural figures. In contrast to his other paintings, Bruegel works here according to tradition. He places his child and his mother at the center of the painting. With other paintings by Bruegel, you often have to look for the main character. These are most likely Italian influences, such as Michelangelo and Correggio. It should also be noted that Bruegel let Jesus be born in a stable instead of a house. See Matthew. Okay, half of a house was also a stable at the time. Sheep and chicken lived in the lower part of the house and the family slept in the upper half of the living room or on the roof. Besides, Bruegel presented the event in his typical realistic style. He avoids poetry and romance and remains true to the Bible in terms of sobriety. The raw reality as the gospel shows us. Composition The central and fixed point in this painting is the child Jesus. It is located at the intersection of the two diagonals. You could divide the work with two circles around the child Jesus. In the first circle around the center, there is a connection with the main figure. In the second circle, you see people who are present. These people have no idea what a heavenly gift they are witnessing. Their faces show that they are imbued with a different spirit. The Inner Circle Within this circle, we see those who are really looking for the king's child. They have gone through an enormous effort and left their own world for a while to find out where and who the child is. They have been touched in their hearts, they went on a search and their search has been rewarded. The Bible teaches that they came from the East, presumably this was Babylonia. The Jewish people had lived in exile in Babylonia more than half a millennium earlier, 586 until 538 before Christ, and had left many traces of their religion there. After the conquest of Babel, the Persians were allowed to return to their promised land, but some also stayed in Babylonia. In this exile, the prophetic writings were ordered and brought together. And so are the prophetic promises surrounding the Messiah. Apparently, even Babylonian musicians have seen the light in the prophecies concerning the Israelite Messiah. In their study of the night skies, they suddenly saw a strange phenomenon. Presumably, these astrologers saw the conjunction of Jupiter, the star of the world ruler, with Saturn, the protector of Palestine. They almost seem to coincide, at least with the naked eye, in the sign of Pisces. This in turn is a symbol of the end times. From these phenomena, they conclude that the end time world ruler or king of kings was born in Israel at that time. So they combine their astrological observations with the Bible prophecies they know. They believe so strongly in their hypotheses that they decided to take this long journey to honor the born king with precious and appropriate gifts. Gifts then given to kings in tribute, gold, frankincense and myrrh. Kings or Maggie. The Gospel only speaks of wise men, yet in the church tradition it has long been referred to as kings of the East. Presumably this has to do with Bible texts such as Psalm 72, 10 to 11. The kings of Tarshish and of the Isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. 
and Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1 to 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. They were even given names, namely Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. They would serve as representatives in the visual arts to portray all of humanity. Caspar, the Asian, Melchior as European, and Balthazar, the African. So, Bruegel here follows this traditional representation of the three kings. Within this circle, we see all visitors whom represent all of humanity and in the foreground we see even the Great Ones kneeling before this Divine Child. In the centre we see the Child Jesus, dressed with a white clot that speaks of his purity and sinlessness. Mary gestures with her right hand as if to say, Look what happened to me. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is not human work. And behind her back, a man with a green headscarf may whisper the following in Joseph's ear. Really, Joseph? Is that your son? He doesn't really look like you, does he? It is truly an incredible and paradoxical event. The people in Jesus' day were actually expecting a king born in a palace with all the luxury and wealth that came with it. Jesus, however, was born in a stable, in a manga, out of a simple woman. You literally need faith to believe that Jesus is a Messiah. This event is beyond comprehension. Kings kneel before this poor child and the King of Israel fears that this child would take his place. So Jesus was born in this primitive stable, but Bruegel places Jesus at the center. And so the painters say symbolically that Jesus is the cornerstone of the temple. Gifts. The gifts of the kings are in strong contrast to the raw event. Are these the treasures of heaven which Jesus himself talks about later in his life? It was common for high-ranking persons visiting a king to give gifts. Think for example of the Ethiopian Queen Sheba who visited Israeli King Solomon and showered him with gold and spices. That still happens today. For example, a panda donated by China when the Chinese Prime Minister visited Belgium. In any case, they speak of a Jesus' future and does have a strong symbolic value. Offering the same gifts to God as in this story already occurred at the time of Moses. In Exodus 25 verse 1 to 8, God said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to give a contribution to me. From everyone who is willing to do so, you must receive a contribution for me. You may receive the following from them, gold, fragrant herbs for the preparation of anointing oil, and perfume and frankincense. Then they can build a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell in their midst. Regarding the gifts the middle king in the painting, Melchior, is the first to offer his gift, namely incense, presented in a clover leaf shaped bowl. With Bruegel, you can always expect a deeper underlying meaning of the shapes of objects he uses in his paintings. For example, the shape of the bowl is a tree leaf clover. This is reminiscent of the late 14th century legend about Saint Patrick who wanted to convert the pagan Irish and explain the Holy Trinity through a tree-leaf clover. The shape of the incense bowl indicates the Holy Trinity. The kings really believed that Jesus was part of that. Incense symbolizes the divinity of Jesus according to many researchers. I would even venture to state, as I just mentioned here, that the kings are synonymous with the Israelites in Exodus. They offer their offerings to the temple, Jesus. The rotting sacrifices tend to such an extent that the incense is used to send a pleasant fragrance to the temple and to God. 
the incense and prophesies about the moment when the Lamb of God will be slaughtered and sits under the decomposing blood. See, lands of the Romans in Jesus' side, blood and water separated, and hangs on the cross. The incense also serves for the moment when Jesus took all the sins of the world upon himself on the cross. See, three hours of fearful darkness. And when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All those sins are a figurative stench to God. At the same time, Melchior symbolically offers our prayers. Why? In Revelation 5.8 we read, And when the Lamb took the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. They each had a zither and golden bowls full of incense. These are the prayers of the saints. Brugo makes worship come first, so Melchior is the first to give this gift, frankincense. It should be noted that on the golden hem of Melchior's stone pink mantle are images of Greek gods including Bacchus, the god of wine. Perhaps this refers to the fact that Melchior represents the Greek, European population. To the left of Melchior, Casper, in his red attire, is ready to present his golden object, a chalice with a lid, a top achievement in the field of goldsmithing. Gold symbolizes Jesus' divinity and kingship. Matthew 2 verse 2 says, Where is the king of the Jews who was born? Gold is the purest, most perfect metal and the most precious. Jesus is God's purest and most precious gift given to mankind. He is sinless and God's only begotten Son, whom God gave to the world, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 Gold is also called the mineral light in India. In John 9 verse 5 says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. On the right we have Balthazar, who will offer myrrh. Myrrh is extracted from the resin of certain trees of the genus Comifora. This refers to Jesus' final burial and to his status as anointed one or the Messiah. It symbolizes his suffering. A tree or a bush had to be injured or beaten for the myrrh to emerge. The taste of myrrh is bitter. But when it comes into contact with the fire, it spreads a pleasant odor. In Jesus' case, we see that he was beaten before he was crucified. By his wounds, we are healed. Like the taste of myrrh, his suffering was bitter. In Isaiah 53 verse 5, we read that the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see the bitter suffering of Jesus, so bad that his sweat became blood. And on the cross, the bitterness of his suffering is expressed through his cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus came into the judgment, the fire, just like myrrh burned in fire, he spread a sweet fragrance to the glory of God the Father. By anointing, we mean the application of oil, balm or ointment to someone. In the Old Testament, especially kings and prophets were anointed and thus consecrated to their ministry. Jesus is the Messiah or Christ, that is the Anointed One. Anointing can also be seen in connection with receiving the Holy Spirit. Objects or people anointed with this oil are set aside, sanctified for the service of God. As a newborn, Jesus is already set apart, sanctified to become the High Priest for excellence. We no longer need a mediator to draw near to God. Through Jesus, we can enter or even become part of the temple in which the Holy Spirit can dwell in our midst. Balthazar's gift represents a golden ship containing a perfume bottle in the shape of a nautilus shell sculpted from jade. A monkey emerges from the opening of the shell, showing a pearl on a golden flower crown. Traditionally, the ship had a religious significance. It speaks of the coming of eternity in time. In other words, 
God to the people. The ship also has a protective or saving function, such as with Noah's Ark. The perfume bottle is shaped like a nautilus shell. This shell speaks of rebirth and perfection. See the golden ratio that can be found in the spiral. The shell is made of the stone jade or nephrite, a gemstone that was mainly worked by the Chinese and was also shipped to the Netherlands in Bruegel's time. In China, jade was considered the noblest of all minerals. The Chinese word for jade could be translated as all that is exquisite in the highest degree. It represents the principle of the Heavenly Father. She is seen as a heavenly jewel. I will read a Chinese text about the jade stone. I invite you to compare it with the characteristics of Jesus. Sanded and shiny, she embodies cleanliness and purity. Smooth and shiny, she is the good. Its compact shape and strength symbolize the strength of intellect and wisdom. It is angular, but not sharp and not dangerous. It is a reminder of justice. Its translucent character is reminiscent of honesty. Brilliant in her play of colors, she resembles the rainbow and is reminiscent of heaven itself, lofty and mysterious. When cut in all simplicity, it is reminiscent of chastity. Because it is highly regarded by everyone, it also represents truth and beauty. Because works of art made of jade never broke, they were also seen as a symbol of immortality. A monkey crawls out of the shell and shows a pearl on a golden crown. A pearl normally comes from an oyster. Here it is an artillery shell. The monkey takes a pearl from the hidden darkness of the shell. In the shell it is a symbol of the unborn child and of the light that shines in the darkness. For Christians, the pearl is therefore mainly seen as a symbol of Christ, the Son of God, who becomes human in the womb of Mary. Thus the pearl becomes a symbol of redemption and baptism, by which the believers are offered the way to redemption. Oddly enough, in the Western Christian tradition, the monkey is depraved, filthy and heretical. Did Bruegel have any other meaning in mind? I was reminded of the Dutch proverb, lodged in the ape. This proverb comes from shipping, and when there were stowaways on board, they were allowed to sleep on the so-called monkey. This was a small square wind sail that could be added in case of a lack of wind. When this happened, the sleeper was rolled out of his blanket and an uncomfortable place to sleep was left. The sleeping place that Joseph and Mary had found was not exactly the most comfortable either. In this inner circle are the people who are attracted to that newborn child. As great as their curiosity, so is their belief in the prophecies written about the child. They were willing to leave their own world and work behind to see this small child yet great miracle. Even if their search led to an ordinary stable and not to a palace to find what they were looking for. Mary in contrast to the other painters in the 16th century, Bruegel paints Mary as a simple Flemish peasant woman with a lovely smile and her eyes almost closed, making her appear calm and peaceful. She also exudes modesty while still carrying the King of Kings on her lap. Personally, I also think that closing her eyes indicates that this child is not the work of people or hers, but of God. Jesus is depicted as transparent or honest, sincere, as the transparent pearl that the monkey is holding, namely naked. The child looks gratefully at Melchior. The Outer Circle Beyond the warmth of the inner circle, the expressions on the faces are quite different. On the right above the African, you see a man, unshaved and wearing glasses. Despite the glasses, he cannot see what is happening. He looks the other way, just like Balthazar, who also looks to the left. We don't see who or what is there. 
The man with the white headscarf to the left of it is also looking quite off. His facial expression does not show any sophistication or intelligence. I already mentioned the man with the green headscarf. He may ask Joseph if he is the real father. Joseph is a broad-shouldered, self-confident man who takes time to listen to what he wants to say to his left. He doesn't care if it is critical or not. Joseph knows better, but at the moment he cannot throw pearls in front of the swine and just starts talking about a dream in which the angel appeared to him. He is glad that everything has gone well so far. His robust body gives the impression that Joseph has resolutely taken on a protective task. He literally and figuratively stands behind his wife Mary. Nothing or no one will come between them. On the other side of Joseph is a soldier with an iron helmet and gloves and a halberd in his hand. His eyes pop open in surprise, but is he looking at Jesus or rather at a precious bowl of incense? The man next to him with the crossbow in his left hand looks with a rather friendly, dreamy look. And next to him is a civilian in dark robes, looking a bit sad above everything. They are clearly not really involved in what is going on. The soldiers behind it are probably the protectors of the kings, who clearly understand even less why they had to come this far. Two of the soldiers hold their halberds exactly in a way that a cross is visible. Is this coincidental? Or is there a prophetic message in it?